was on the phone early this week with the head of the university that I attend, and we were having an interesting, actually it was a communication exchange, multiple different communications, I should say it that way, so multifaceted here. But something was shared with me um, that was kind of interesting. The decline, and this is not coming from me, this is something that was shared with me, the, the decline in general of people being interested in, um, we'll call it the deeper things. And that prompted this individual to share with me that they had attended a church service where they had listened to a sermon, which I'm still going to find out who the preacher was and what sermon was preached. But the essence of the message was if only people were desperate for God. And when this was shared with me again, you know, sometimes words have meanings and they can carry different meanings. The first thing that went to my, into my brain was desperate for God as in desperate for him to appear. The Bible says we don't have to, you know, reach down or reach up. He's, he's here. Or better yet, the New Testament, Matthew 18, 20 says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst. So it couldn't possibly have that meaning. Or on the singular note, fear not, I am with thee, out of Isaiah. So it couldn't mean that type of desiring for God's presence as in God is absent. But being desperate for God, and that concept began to germinate in my brain. Of course, this is the way I process things. I was thinking about it so much, I even had a discussion with you about it. I was telling you about what was shared, what was said. And I thought, you know, if only people had a heart like that today, where they were, had that mindset. Of course, I thought, oh, I, you know, I, I don't want to, this is not my subject, I don't want to deal with this. But then, of course, curiosity kills the cat. I started going down the pathway of um, looking at, just for the sake, I guess, of my curiosity, the etymology, which is, it, it should have been so clear to me for desperate or despair following the etymological roots, just curiosity based on this conversation, which led me down the pathway to this message. Somehow you never know what things will bring you to preach a message. So um, I began with this looking at the word for despair or desperate, which comes from the Latin desperatus, which is given up, despaired in the past participle sense of driven to recklessness. It's only in the 1950s here that the, the term um, desperate for something is having a great desire. So it's only by 1950s that we go, oh, I'm desperate for chocolate cake, right? <laughs> having a great desire. And I'm sure that's the way uh, the head of the university meant that, both from this sermon that he heard and then what he carried in his heart. Um, but to have a great desire for is more, it's a more modern thing. If you keep going down the word trail, early 14th century, is divided, the word is divided in two. De as a prefix, which is without, and sperar, you who are Latino know hope. So without hope. Um, if you bring the word search into the Proto-Indo-European, you've got the root of S-P-E, which interestingly enough is to thrive or prosper. So if you were to put the D prefix back on, it would be essentially without prospering, without thriving, which essentially carries the essential meaning of the whole world. word. And if you keep uh, winding down the word trail in the Proto-Indo-European, the S-P-E root, success and hope, is attached to words like Godspeed, which in the most uh, archaic use meant may God prosper. People would say, Godspeed, may God prosper you on your travels, may God protect you. But seemingly it carried that uh, positive success. The hope cognate is still back there. So 
um, I, I kind of went through that and I thought that's interesting because that brings me to a bifurcated view of despair and desperate. One obviously is with, without hope, hopelessness, and the, the other one is the more modern frame, which is to greatly desire. And they carry two different dynamics. Now, I don't have a complicated message, but I thought, you know, it's worth it for me to mine this a little bit, probably because I think that most people will fit into one category or the other, which is greatly desiring, having a great desire, yearning, contending, earnestly wanting more, and those people who are without. Really, that boils down to two groups. I always come back to this. Why is it only there's only two groups of people? But there we go again. There's just two groups right there. If I search the Hebrew, which I did, the Hebrew has two words that carry, if you were going to look up despair or desperate in the Strong's, which is only the concordance to the King James. So if you're using an NIV, if you're using any other source, and you try and use the Strong's, you might have some issues because it's not designed for that. It's designed for the King James. But out of the King James, if you were to look that up, you'd only find two Hebrew words. One is yaash, which carries with it uh, to desist, to despond, to despair, no hope. Um, and this word yaash is primarily used, believe it or not, of the house of Israel having gone into idolatry and worshipped other gods, they became yaash, they became without hope because hope was in him and still is in him. They became hopeless. Um, the other word, we actually attach it to a word for man or men, but not Adam, not Adam, but anash or inash, which is a weaker version, and anash the word that is used in the Hebrew for two references, I believe, in the Strong's have to do with the frailty of man. Weak, frail, incurable. And I thought, you know, when you start looking at words, this is why I don't understand how people can not be interested in, in the details. Please don't say the devil's in them. <laughs> but how people cannot be interested in the details because the details are quite powerful. If you think about it, these two words, these two Hebrew words, yash, to denote the helplessness, or the hopelessness, rather, and inush, which describes the frailty of man, incurable, without God's help. God has the remedy. So these two words almost bring you back to my bifurcated uh, English word search anyway. Um, if we look at these two concepts today, which is what I intend to do, um, I really want something to come alive for us. There's levels of things. People can be hopeless. You know, you get a diagnosis of a disease. You sit in front of your doctor and your doctor says you have cancer. Or you need an organ transplant and you've got the rarest form of something and the hardest thing to find. And your mind may settle into hopelessness. Or maybe it's you've been looking for a job for the last five years and can't find one. You're either losing your house or in the midst of losing your house or have lost your house or are homeless. It looks hopeless. There's, there's a place for each person to find their spot. Now, some people have what I call the spirit of exaggeration. Um, they'll find an ant in their, you know, in their driveway and they'll say, it's hopeless. <laughs> can't get rid of all the bugs. It's hopeless. But I'm talking about the real stuff now. I'm talking about the real, the things that um, tend to inhabit and haunt. They, you can't sleep at night even. You're uh, consumed with these things, that spirit of hopelessness. Now, there's, there's two camps of people within that. There are those people who are believers, and they have essentially lost hope. And I've met a few like that. You go along the way. And it seems like everything that could possibly happen in the negative happens to you. Do you know anybody like that? Yeah. It just so happens to you. And people that you talk to say, wow, you got bad karma. <laughs> now, if I wanted to go back and preach last week's message, I'd tell you, 
you probably have all this stuff dumped on you, not all from the devil. Some of it, I believe, is testing from God. Now, don't, please don't go Jamesy on him and say, oh, God doesn't tempt anybody. Of course he does. That's why God told Abram to take Isaac, the son of promise, go sacrifice him on the hill. He wanted to see what was in his heart. Or I mentioned to you the test that I believe God, these people did not need to be 40 years in the wilderness. Are you kidding me? The test was at Kadesh Barnea. They could, they, there was a number of things they could have done, but they didn't. They failed the test. And God doesn't announce, hey, tomorrow at 10 a.m. there's going to be a test. Be ready. <laughs> That's why we teach people how to have faith. And faith is put in action the moment something that looks like a test may look like temptation. Faith is put in action at that moment. It's all the years of listening. You might say, wow, well, you know, I know this message. I know this lesson. I've listened. I've listened. Well, the proof is in the pudding, friend, that when the stuff hits the fan, you're not going back to your former ways of dealing with the situation, but you're now looking at it through the eyes of someone who has been taught the Word of God. Hopefully the Word has been engrafted. And it doesn't mean you now perform, go. It doesn't mean that like somehow you're like Pavlov's dog. You've been trained to do this thing. But at least some gear eventually will switch in your mind. I know what to do. When the trials come or when the fear comes, what time I'm afraid, I will trust. When you see that doctor coming down the hallway with the real stern look because, you know, there's some bearer of some scary news, you've got the promise of life eternal and this is just a temporary tabernacle you inhabit down here. All of these things kick in in the moment that faith begins to look at everything and say, no. This is not all. That's why I often go back and I look at Hebrews because Hebrews, especially Hebrews 11, gives me that clarity. These people didn't have the certainty that we have. We've got the book. They didn't. And yet it says these all died not having obtained the promise. How much more we who have obtained. And that's why all the promises in the book are mine and yours in Christ. As long as we stay in faith, there's no other criteria. But can a Christian become hopeless? Absolutely doesn't mean just because you have come to the faith that you're going to walk the straight and now. You're never going to veer again. It's never going to waver. And anybody who says they've never wavered is a lunatic. You can never waver. Maybe you can never waver in your love of the Lord. You might love the Lord as much today or more than you did 20 or 30 years ago. But faith, faith is, there's ebbs and flows. I've said that before. Some days, you know, when you hear, as I said, a diagnosis or you something that is so terrible, it creates the opportunity to bring you to your knees. It creates the vacuum by the way that somehow God knows what we need. He knows, by the way, how to bring us to our knees. And I've said that's the wonder, that's the miracle of God. So can Christians become hopeless? Yes, they can. And there's a cure for that. Even the prophet of old, Habakkuk, his first cry is, how long, O Lord, how long? crying out essentially, how long must I wait for you to essentially show your hand? Are you not the living God? And that's out of the mouth of the prophet speaking to the people. How long? So, no, don't think when I say people of God can't, they can, because many in the book became hopeless and full of despair. Now, there's the other side of this, which is greatly desiring God. Like the psalmist in Psalm 42 says, My heart panteth after God, looking earnestly, my soul, like someone who's earnestly desiring. Cannot, the need for the soul is like thirst. I need that water. This is that same type of desiring. So you know, we've got two different dynamics we're looking at. And although at times I've, during the preparation of this message, thought it seems too simple, but I think not. And I think looking at these uh, two different categories, one is seeking earnestly, greatly desiring the, we'll call it the 1950s, uh, more modern version, or the more archaic and older without hope. Both carry something for each and every one of us today. Now, as always, I preach. And I think that there are some in the sanctuary you came in today and you feel good. 
and you would have preferred me to tell you about praise or about how the sun is shining and you know how good your back's going to feel when you get up out of that chair or whatever body part is you're leaning on right now. But I have a feeling that a lot of the messages that I preach, they're not necessarily application for everybody in the moment I preach them. But eventually, because it's God's word, it's not something that I think, oh, this is by my design. It's God's word eventually. It's like going to prepare a meal and you need a certain spice. You cook Mexican food, you need a certain spice. You cook Italian food, you need a certain spice. As human beings, we have a range of emotions and the range of emotions as believers is painted in the rainbow of God's book and through the messages, hopefully, that I preach to you that will minister to you either today or when you need them. So first we're going to look at a few people who are what I've called their spiritual vignettes to give us an idea of their condition. Please go with me to John 5. All right. <clears throat> John 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool which is called, in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. He had. Certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. And I want to stop right there for a second. Now, I will say this for the man. He didn't give up, but 38 years. It doesn't say he was there for 38 years, but he had an infirmity for 38 years. So I can't say that he fits the category of complete hopelessness. But maybe he does fit the category, perhaps, of greatly desiring. You see, it can go either way, depending on if we knew a little bit more of the details. But it doesn't matter. 38 years of infirmity. Now, I'm, I'm talking right now about sickness because it seems to be the, the top of the list. We go down the things that people have to contend with. Sickness tends to be at the top of the list. I read an article two days ago by someone who's really got the spirit of Antichrist, but uh, why Christians don't get healed because God doesn't heal anymore. And I thought to myself, first of all, that person is a moron. Um, God heals first the spirit. Before, a lot of times before God will even heal the body, even for someone who has been saved. There's spirit work to be done before the healing occurs, and I believe that. That's something that I have combed and searched the scriptures, and I really believe that um, sometimes somebody can say with their mouth, well, the Lord heals. But in their mind, they think, well, the Lord won't heal me, or I haven't seen the Lord do anything like that, so therefore. And these are seeds of doubt, and doubt, by the way, is another human, sinful but human condition and I think everybody suffers from it. Thomas is the crowning uh, example of doubt. Nevertheless, this article went on to say that, you know, people should not waste their time. And I began to think, you know, the interesting thing is the Bible, if you read it, I guess if you read it, you'd have to throw it away as a fabrication because there are enough people here who were, they were waiting for something. And that something was actually someone who had not yet come. But they were waiting. Here's a man who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he'd been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? I, again, I say I'm not sure whether hopeless or greatly desiring. In either case, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but when I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Sounds like a good excuse. For me, if I was that man, I would have just rolled myself and been like a steamroller and bowled everybody down and 
like, move out of the way, I'm coming through. Like, like magic carpet ride. If you're in my way, you're going with me. Well, I'll get healed at the same time. <laughs> Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. On the same day was the Sabbath. And then we go into another part, another detail. My focus is on this. Whether the man was in a hopeless state or greatly desiring, all it took, in this case, it doesn't say that the man exercised anything. It was the words of Jesus spoken to him. And I wonder why, and again, I say this for the benefit of those people who may be on either side of this, greatly desiring but have not yet obtained, desperate in that way, or out of hope, hopeless. I'm not sure where this man fits, but the one thing I know is it took the speaking of Jesus and the asking of a question, wilt thou be made whole? And the man, the man should have, if it was me, and I was answering as the man, forgive me, I would have said, hell yeah! <laughs> right? <laughs> Get me out of here! <laughs> I don't want to lay at this pool anymore. I can't just... But it took just the speaking of Jesus. Rise, take up thy bed, walk. Now let me ask you something. Now, people who talk about hearing God's word, but God still speaks to us today through his word. He's still speaking the same thing. So for you who are on the fence about your condition, whether it's 38 years or 38 months or 38 days, and whether you are in the hopeless condition or the greatly desperate for condition, as, as in, I need this to happen. I have faith, but I need this to happen. I want you to listen to the voice of Jesus today. I, want you, I don't want you to hear me. I want you to look past me and don't look at this as just a mere story, but Jesus speaking to the man, asking the question, and then speaking directly to him and saying, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. Please don't tell me that you have a problem today that Jesus can not solve. Please don't tell me that you came here today thinking that there is no, no remedy left for you. Because I'm going to give you another example of somebody completely outside of, we'll call it outside of the box. She is in Matthew 15. And I picked her as an example for those people who are just coming into the church Matthew 15, beginning at verse 21, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the coast, cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. By the way, a little footnote for some of you who are waiting for me to come back to the lost tribes teachings. There's an interesting reference right there. Footnote, note to self for future messages. <laughs> Focus. <laughs> then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is, it is not meat to take the ch of the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. The children's bread referring to those to whom he would first go to, and dogs referring to those outside of the box, including this woman, who is a Gentile woman, obviously. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She knew he had the capacity, he was able. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, Great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And what I want you to look at there is the fact that undoubtedly, as a woman, we'll call her, now there was no church at this time, but I'm going to use the word church. Undoubtedly, as someone outside of the church or outside of the followers of Christ, she had to have heard that this man has the power to heal and to heal her daughter. And not even bringing, think about this, not even bringing the daughter, 
she came and said, my daughter is vexed with the devil. Daughter is not, whether she brought the daughter or not, she says, this is that, and from that moment, the daughter was made whole. I think it's interesting. Now, we don't know, again, you have to forgive me, because it teeters on both sides of the fence. Was this woman hopeless? Because she didn't have the hope that the children of Israel and the ones that would have heard, that would have placed their hope in the oracles of God, would have known as a Gentile, as a person out there in the world not knowing. And I'm talking now to people who have not come to a knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, truly. Not the caricature, not the evangelist version, not the soapbox version, but what the Bible declares about Jesus Christ, that he revealed God in the flesh, coming to reconcile us back to God, giving us a pathway back, ruined at the first. So whether this woman came in hopelessness, desperate, de speratus, without hope, or whether she came greatly desiring. My interest is that she came with an expectancy, unlike the man that we just looked at at the pool, who had no expectancy because his first thing was an excuse. There's nobody put me in the water. She came expecting. So I'm going to lean towards the fact that she had great desire. Her, her desperate cause there was she had great desire. But her desire was more to have her daughter healed than it was to see a miracle worked, although she came with some great faith that Jesus even acknowledges this, as great as thy faith. Now, why is it, I'm going to ask you again, especially if you're listening today, and you have some problem that you think God cannot fix, why is it that a woman outside of the church, outside of the box, outside of the group of people that had been exposed with knowledge, and yet she comes and she knows he is able. So I'm going to ask you again, is there a problem? And it's rhetorical. Answer it quietly in your heart and your mind. Is there a problem that you have that God cannot fix? The Bible says with God all things are possible. That you've got to start somewhere, even if you're hopeless today. Now the woman didn't come in hopelessness. Obviously she, she had faith. But there are some more people here. Not done. Let's go to Mark 2. These are all familiar passages for most of you. In Mark 2, the beginning of the chapter, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Boy, I, I want to do it. You know, I want to do it. Jesus is in the house. Sorry. <laughs> you awake now? Only three of you said yes. And straightway, many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. That's, they were just packed in there. And he preached the word unto them. They come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let the bed down wherein the sick of palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven. Now it's interesting, you know, there's a whole situation that arises out of this with the people who are looking at this and thinking this is crazy, but in speaking to the man, I want to jump over and stay focused on the fact that Jesus speaks to the man, and he says to him, Arise, take up thy bed, go thy way, go into thine house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, went forth before them all. They were all amazed, all right? And the point here is that I believe it was the friends. I don't know if it was the man that had the, the deep desire or the hopelessness, but the friends knew that if they could just get him, the sick one, in front of Jesus, they had great desire, desperately needing to get him in front of Jesus, knowing that Jesus can and would. I don't know how many people with a need today have that type of faith. But if you're not there yet, 
and you keep looking at what's going on, I ask the question, why is it that we read these and we read these and see that Jesus speaks the word, and it's no different, by the way, than in the Old Testament. The Psalms declare that God sent his word and he healed them all as they were going out of Egypt. Why do we think differently? What hinders our mind? So I'm going to ask again, but I'm going to ask it with a, a greater tone of faith, not with despair, not with hopelessness, but here with great desperation, but that of faith that says, if you're sick today, like this man whom the friends brought, you have a lot of credit to have friends like that who understand Jesus can heal you. Not too many people, I've not met too many people who would be friend enough to me to say, this is what you need. You ever try and give somebody advice about what they need and they won't take it? And we're not talking about your busybody and you like to give advice all the time. <laughs> like you have an advice column every day to all the people you know and they're like, oh God, stop. But you know the stuff I'm talking about where you, you know that you know, to quote Dr. Scott Gordon, Oral Roberts, you know that you know that you know that you know something, which doesn't make you a know-it-all, but you try to share it with somebody and they won't hear. Oh, no, don't talk to me about that. Very frustrating. But to have friends that would carry you on a bed and bring you to Christ. They don't make them like that anymore. That's all I want to say about that right there. The last one I'm going to look at right here in these conditions in these types is in Luke 17. And I chose all these because they have some similarity to them. And in Luke 17, beginning at verse 11, we have the cleansing of the lepers. 17:11. Page 1297, if you have a Bible like mine. I can't resist. <laughs> it's that Scott thing. You know? <laughs> it's his fault. Blame him. All right. It came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. As he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So, here we have something which is a combination, undoubtedly, but I would say desperately knowing because they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They have this certain knowledge Jesus can. When he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourself unto the priest. It came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Now, I'm not really interested in the rest of the passage for the rest of the passage carries its own message about coming back to give thanks to God when you receive, which we should do anyway. But I'm looking at these people in the exact manner that I want you to look at your circumstance today. Greatly desiring, desperately wanting, and that doesn't mean begging and pleading and oh, sniveling before God. We're talking about something that is a not a groveling, sniveling thing. When I say desperate, I don't want you to mis-caricature my words. I'm talking about something that you so desperately desire inside, but it's a faith mechanism. We know what hopelessness, hopelessness looks like. It carries very little or no faith. But this type of desiring is full of faith. It's the same type of faith that I think a man like Zacchaeus, when he came out to see Jesus, had. Even though he was a rotten scoundrel, doesn't matter. He went up in the tree to see Jesus. He wanted, he had an earnest desire. And I don't want to call it desperate as in desperation, but I want to say that inside, I think inside this man, conviction had already taken place, the seeds of it at least by the Holy Spirit, to know there was something that he needed to listen to Christ that he would climb up in a tree. He says he was a man of little stature, but come on, you could easily just get a ladder. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, or sit on a donkey or something and be higher up. But what's interesting about Zacchaeus 
is there is that earnestness. And that's what I'm trying to distinguish between these people I've shown you, these biblical vignettes of people who absolutely go from very little or no faith, like the man for 38 years, all the way to these that are crying out to Jesus, knowing Jesus, Master, heal us, because they knew he could. That desperate, but it's, it is an act of saying, I know you can, Lord, I'm just waiting for you to do it. And to wait patiently on the Lord, oh, Lord, give me that gift, right? Because we can say we know what the word is, but then to wait on the Lord is a completely different thing. Now, I could have, trust me, I could have, if I wanted to go to catalog all the hopeless people, and there are many in the Bible, I could have cataloged those people who, much like Jonah, he knew he was in the wrong by running away, and when he's in the belly of the great fish, it's as if he was crying out from hell. There at that moment was a change from hopeless to the expectancy for God to answer. But right before God indeed does answer, there was hopelessness, trust me, in that moment. So I think that all of these paint a picture and they give us understanding. And may we find ourselves between one or the other. Um, there's great value, by the way, in looking at two things that the Apostle Paul uh, writes that are of the greatly desiring, desperate modern version, greatly desiring, desperately wanting something for the sake of Christ, not for the sake of self. And there are two prayers that he prays. One of them, in fact, I read from last week, so let's go there, uh, out of Ephesians. Ephesians 1, beginning at about verse 17, I think, which is a great prayer. And he's writing to these Ephesians, and he says that the God, Ephesians 1, and verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Let me pause right there, though I don't, I'm not finished, but what is the hope of his calling? What an incredible prayer for those people who have heard the gospel, essentially responded, and are being blessed with Paul's petition for them to have greater knowledge. So therefore, I'd say he desperately wants them to have the understanding and the fullness of the revelation of Christ. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and as we go on. But that particular part of the prayer that is essentially Paul saying, I desperately as the pastor writing this letter to this church, I desperately want you to know all the fullness of Christ. Now, I think that's what was intended in this conversation that I had with the head of the university. I think that's what was intended, that people would come to a greater knowledge and they would come to a greater reality and desire a more fuller understanding and not just be these surface. In fact, one of the conversations uh, that I had with somebody else had some tone of this saying, the pews may be full, but there are a lot of cold hearts. And I thought, well, listen, I'm nobody's judge. Nobody knows the heart of a person except God. But you can know this, that a church that is either being persecuted or a church that understands what true repentance is, that is turning from your way towards him, brings a whole new spirit into the church. It doesn't bring a spirit of entitlement. It doesn't bring a spirit of pride. It doesn't bring a, a spirit of, look at us, we've arrived. It brings a spirit of humility because we've suffered humiliation. Usually it's in the 
at the hand of God in the face of others. And if we can get over our pride, that experience makes us most precious in God's eyes. So, you know, you be begin to see all of these things, and I think just to, to pray a prayer like this, earnestly desiring for the people to come to a fuller knowledge. Now that, by the way, many years ago birthed a whole movement, which I think Dr. Tozer may, may have been a part of and then withdrawn from slightly. There was ebbs and flows, but the, the deeper life people, and that birthed a, another holiness movement, which that doesn't sound too good either. Uh, <laughs> I'll save that one for later. Uh, but where people began to say that there were multiple works, not, you know, there, there were multiple works of grace and multiple acts, and that began a whole series of pecking orders within the church. But there's nothing wrong with, I don't want to go on that because that opens up a whole door to things that I'm not even trying to talk about. But what I do want to say is if somebody desperately, we're talking in the positive, desires, then there should be nothing that hinders you that way because it says if you seek the Lord with all your heart. Now, I don't know too many that have because even if a, a, a truly good-hearted person seeking the Lord with all their heart is still flesh and is still human and is still susceptible to other desires which Paul talks about in his letters talking about the battle, the trench warfare between the two. But what I'm saying to you is to earnestly desire more. And I would say this, I've said this before, if God never gave me another thing, if he never did another thing for me, I can't even begin to give God the thanks for all the things he's done. And I'm not just talking about since I've known him. I'm talking about the fact that I look back and see what God spared me from before I knew he was operating in my life. And then you begin to just shake your head and say, what an incredible God we serve. Now, if you're around me any amount of time, you'll, all, you'll hear me say that. It's still, I still do this at times. You know, like, could God really, could God have condescended to me? And that's the type of attitude that you, you keep desiring. And I want to use the word desperately in a good way. I desire to know more. And that's the other prayer that Paul prayed for himself. Uh, Philippians, if you'll turn there. Philippians 3. And in Philippians 3, it's just actually, it's a, it's a part that I'm lifting out, so forgive me. It's not text out of context by any means, but it's just a part of something that he's saying. Philippians 3 and a part of verse 10, that I may know him. That is fitting into the category of greatly desiring in, in, in the more modern way, desperately wanting something, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Well, obviously, because conformable unto his death is conformable unto his resurrection. But the first part of this, that I may know him, and that is a great prayer from a man who had personal experience and a personal encounter, and he's still saying, with more desiring, with greater desiring, like those people that he's writing to right here, that they begged with much begging to give their offerings out of their deep poverty. It's the same mindset that always is looking to the greater picture. You know, Christianity in America costs nothing. It's cheap. It's as cheap as a structure being erected and a cross being put out on the street and people filing into a building. There is no pain or persecution per se. Um, maybe that will come in the next 10 years from government hindrances. But there is no pain or persecution like there is in other parts of the world. So Christianity in America is cheap. You can take it or leave it. Church is uh, an inconvenience to your work weekend time off. You think about that. Or you have this attitude which says, I desire 
desperately to know him better. Now, if, if you're married to somebody for a long time, you can know somebody. Oh, God, that's the way she is. Or, you know, yeah, yeah, I know. I've been married to him for, you know, 20, 30 years. Yeah, I know all about it. But I don't know that we ever, even though we know the person, their habits, their, their I don't know that we ever know the deepest parts of this chamber we call the mind, which heart and mind together. And I think there's always things that we can learn, even after 20 and 30 years of being married to somebody or spending time with them. There's things you can learn, and I think it's much more and greater with God. There are people that come into the church and they are taught formulas and creeds and they can recite the creeds and they can recite the scriptures and they can say John 3.16 or whatever their favorite passage is. But reaching into the book, even doing word studies and taking the time to just, it's almost like digesting one word, one syllable, one concept, and even though that seems like, wow, I've just taken 20 steps back, I, am I losing brain cells because of that? No, you're not. Actually, what you're doing is you're taking the time to slow down and listen to every single word that God has laid out here in the book. And I think when that happens, that's when one is actually desperately seeking and desiring. It's not, as I said, I want to make sure you, you don't misunderstand. This is not about on the knees groveling, please, God. Uh, I'm not, that's nowhere near my concept. That might be those who are hopeless, but not even then, because if, the, if you're crying out to God like that, you are still expecting God to do something. You don't cry out to God unless you expect for him to act. There, there's at least one little thread still there that says, please, God. That's not the type of desperation I'm talking about. Now, for those people who have come into the building today, you're listening to me, and you say, well, I, I'm not in the hopeless category, but I am in the greatly desiring category. Or maybe you find yourself in the, I used to be greatly desiring, but I feel kind of cold. And listen, these are the things that I must, now I must talk to you straight out, because this happens to people all the time where you get a little cold in your desiring, your desperation is more like, I do what I have to do and I do the bare minimum. And I want to speak to some of you who are there like that and ask you a very important question because it's probably, it, it fits everything that I've said. If a person is to say, I will spend eternity with God, I want to ask you what your relationship will be like with God. That's not to say that I think because somebody falls back or has moments, because I said it's ebb and flow, that somehow that's going to take you to hell. But I'm asking you today, if you've just felt a little bit more distant, to consider a term I've used repeatedly, taking some spiritual inventory and analyzing where your priorities are, because the, the deeply desiring is almost like a checkbook, if you look, if that even exists anymore. If you look at your checkbook and you see where you spend the most money, that'll usually tell you where your greatest interests are. I'm talking apart from food and the necessities of living. Wherever you spend the most money, that's where your greatest interests are. And not that that's inherently wrong or bad, but it's the same way with God. And you begin to look at how much time is spent praising God just for the sake of praising Him. And there's that, that's that wonderful gift that we ought to do anyway versus the time that we spend actually talking to God about our problems before we talk to somebody else, versus reflecting and meditating on his word and maybe, in a strange way, asking him to plant the seeds of his word into your heart. I know that's kind of a strange way of saying that. Versus, I don't pray at all, I don't read at all, I don't read my Bible at all, I come to church because I do once in a while to make an appearance. Well, there's people that come, they're holiday believers. They're on holiday most of the year, right? <laughs> so if you came in today and you're not quite in the greatly desiring, desperate, in the faith mode version, then I'm asking you today to take a little bit of spiritual inventory 
and I'm wanting to send you out of here today with a few promises. Um, you know, our strength comes from Him. Our focus is and should be directed at Him. And as I mentioned, praise is uh, an incredible key. Forgive me, I'm going to interrupt myself to ask the question. Let me find uh, there's a, a couple of moms I could ask here. But which mother in this room doesn't like her children or her husband to come back and say, thanks, mom, for preparing dinner? Which mom doesn't like that? Now, you don't expect it because you do it, you love them, you don't expect it. But which mom doesn't love to hear the words, thanks, mom, or thanks, dad, for doing this? So think about it. How much more your heavenly father when you don't come back and give him thanks for the very simple things that he does for you. It's easy to just think that they're there, but they're there because he put them there. So praise is an integral part of this. But what I want to send you out of here with is for those who might be in the middle. Because, you know, hopeless, hopeless is a place where you can, if I can give you a little bit of an ignition to have faith, you can walk out of here today and say, I have little faith, I believe, help mine unbelief, or small steps. And if you're greatly desiring, then the faith mechanism is there. But for those who find themselves in the middle, I'm speaking to you right now because you are the ones that need the encouragement in the Word to point you in the right direction. Isaiah 40 is for you. And you know this because this is a promise oftentimes quoted here. Isaiah 40, beginning at verse 29, I'll start reading at verse 29, and if I can just say this to you, while you find Isaiah 40, it was two weeks before Dr. Scott died. In the two weeks before he died, which would have been the final week that he came to you in the sanctuary, He had gone through so much. And unlike the times where he was healthy and could read and do all the things he would do, in those last weeks, he depended on me and my very, uh, we'll call it embryo faith, to help him. And I remember sitting with him in the morning. He was sitting at breakfast, and he was, he was just weeping. And it's kind of funny, because most people, if you ever saw Dr. Scott, in the moments that you saw him shed a tear, he could turn on the waterworks, trust me. They, didn't, you know, they weren't like long-lasting like I'm doing right now. When I talk to you about this, it makes me, you, you can't help it. But I remember him sitting at the table and weeping. And he said, I love the Lord. He had very, not a very strong uh, voice. He said, I love the Lord, but today I am extremely weak. And this was about an hour from the time that I had to get him to the church. And I still remember he could not fit into his clothes. He was in his pajamas. Um, I said to him, I want to give you a verse of scripture. This is from a man who had 50, 50, oh, 50 years in the ministry, 50 years, let alone being raised a preacher's kid. If anybody preached the faith, how to have faith, how to be faithing ones, it was him. And yet that morning, the weeping, I think, was one part like Habakkuk, how long, O oh Lord? And I think the other part was desiring to be able to get up and be well. So I think there was two dynamics, just like my message, two dynamics. And I remember sitting across from him and reading 
these verses to him. Beginning at verse 29, he giveth power to the faint. Are you there? He giveth power to the faint. I mean, not are you in the page. Are you on the page with me? In other words, that those people who may not have the power today, there's no shame as a Christian in being somewhere back halfway up the mountain. As long as you don't fall into deep despair, as in there is no hope, there is no problem, that God cannot fix. He giveth power to the faint, to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I don't know if that's you today. I don't know if you are in the middle if you've lost hope, this will give you something to hang on to. But if you're right there in the middle, I urge you to claim this promise, he giveth power to the faint. It means those who have run out. And I've said this to you before, that's probably when you will find the closest proximity to God is when you cannot and when you know that he can and he did, and he's going to continue to. Now, as long as you and I latch on to this and we keep acting in faith, those who came in today, or maybe this is on a rerun and you're listening saying, I know when she preached that, I was thinking, that's great for somebody else, but today I really need that. And I've been there, the recipient, the one who said, boy, I really needed that. I ask you to stop in your tracks Grab hold of this promise because he'll give you the power. You wait upon the Lord and you wait and see. He will bring you through. There is no problem God can't solve like those I've quoted earlier or like those who are in the sanctuary today or listening to me who need God to do something and are earnestly expecting somewhere hanging on by a thread or right in the middle. Begin with this. God will look down and see your condition. Pick you up. You just wait. And it says, The Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.